If someone had told us back then, yo, 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 boys, maybe if you broadcast this on the internet, you could even make money doing it. We'd be like, why are we at university exactly? Ha! Got it! Got it! Today's video is brought to you by Underlucky Stars. You can go to underluckystars.com forward slash brainblaze and you'll get 10% off. More about them in a bit. Welcome back to another Brainblaze segment. It's Culture Corner, the most expensive video games ever made. 1983, a software house decides to release a major new title. They lock away a single coder in a darkened room for a month or two, feeding and watering him occasionally until he has produced a playable game. After the coder is finished, he will be paid about 50 quid and given a pat on the head. The software house might even chuck a few grand at the packaging and manufacturing and distribution and maybe even a couple of adverts in Micro Misery magazine. And then they'd sit back and wait for Percy the Potty Pigeon to hopefully top the software charts. I mean, back in the day, entirely possible the standard of quality was fairly low. Although, then again, like, Flappy Bird became a thing a few years ago. It's like, okay, <laughs> that Wordle game that is, sh like, storming around the world right now. Didn't some guy just knock that off while he had COVID or something? It's like, amazing. <laughs> However, 2022, a leading video game company decides to release a major new title. It's going to take several years and about $200 million. We've come a long, long way since Percy the Potty Pigeon. What does surprise me is it isn't like one of those Marvel movies. Doesn't that cost like half a billy? And it's like, how the f I mean, I know that the actors are expensive and shit, but it's like, you look at a game like Grand Theft Auto V, which is still going strong like a basically a decade later, or Red Dead Redemption. And it's like, these are extremely complex. And look, they look like real people. They look like real people. And it's like way cheaper than some movie where it's, I don't know, Iron Man flying around in a suit and shit. And it's like, yeah, of course they look real, because they're real. I don't understand how there's that, I mean, 200 million sounds like an absolute bargain. I know Danny's trying to make a point. Oh, Danny writes the script. I read it if you're new here. Uh, I know Danny's trying to make a point and I'm absolutely sh** all over it. But, uh, but, but still, but still. This is the way. This is the way. This is the way. It seems strange looking back to a time when a video game based on a film was usually a cheap and crude attempt to squeeze out a few more bucks from a massive multi-million dollar movie. And oh boy, as a kid, was I, tell me guys, was I the only one who got absolutely suckered for that over and over again? Oh, new Spider-Man, I bet that matching game's looking good. I mean, it's got the same cover as the DVD. It's gonna be good. I bet that Matrix game is great. Batman, yes, I'm in. I was, I can't have been the only one, but I got suckered in every time, just assuming it's going to be just like the movie, and then it was shit. Allegedly. It is shit, Austin. Oh good, then it's not just me. Players of early video game adaptations such as E.T., Raiders of the Lost Ark, and Porky's were very unlikely to feel particularly immersed in an authentic interpretation of the film. No, because they were always shit. I really loved the Star Trek games, though. Star Trek Armada. Mwah. It's like, uh, it was like Age of Empires or some but with space planes. It was great. Smashing, Basil. By space planes, I mean starships. <laughs> What's wrong with me? But the video game industry is no longer just serving pale children and peculiar men who live in their sheds with their pet ferrets. Danny? The value of the global gaming industry surged to a new high of $173 billion in 2021, and that's not entirely because we were all in lockdown and had nothing better to do. But like, I mean, that was definitely a contributing factor. If I hadn't had two kids during COVID, um, I would my, my video game playing would have absolutely skyrocketed no end. In the coming years, the industry is predicted to grow bigger than the global movie and global beard oil markets combined. Ah, <laughs> Daddy, I think you're desperately underestimating the value of the global beard oil market then. A few moments later. And speaking of beard oils, why don't you try my beard oil? There is a link below. We actually have a whole range of them. Yes, yes. What's this? And unexpected commercial break this one's even the shave tonic you can even take a little hit don't drink it don't drink it don't drink. i'm just kidding it just smells so good it just smells i just want to slap it onto my face right now but i'm not going to because i'm a consummate professional daddy chill and we've already there's a link below and we've already passed the point when the and we've already passed the point where the big 
And we've already passed the point where the budget for a major new game is likely to surpass the budget for a major new movie title. Have we, though? I guess we have. Danny's usually right. I just sit here and read what he writes. Star Wars is a pretty good opening example when Electronic Arts first started knocking around ideas for a new massively multiplayer online role-playing game. God damn, it's a mouthful. Based on Star Wars in 2005, they may not have suspected at the time that it would end up costing more to develop than the latest blockbuster movie in the franchise. Revenge of the Sith released that very same year. Never seen that movie, never played this game, and I'm happier for it. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. And although you might think that any company releasing a new Star Wars product is destined to be laughing all the way to the intergalactic banking clan, the reported investment of $200 million over six years was seen by some as a risky misstep. By the time Star Wars The Old Republic was released to the PC in 2011, oh my god, they were like, we wanted to tie it in with a movie in 2006 and it didn't come out until 2011? That's five years, my guys. This was partly because the MMORPG scene had been buzzing when Electronic Arts first signed the deal with LucasArts. It appeared to be in decline following the ambitious six-year six gestation period. Was it six years? I'm six. I'm so dumb. Uh, even World of Warcraft had just lost two million subscribers. I never played any of these MMORPG games. I was like, uh, well, Warcraft was obviously always the big one. I think Starcraft was another one. And I had a mate who was super. Was it, he was super into Starcraft or? Was there another one? There was another big space one, maybe called E something? I think that's what he was actually into. But the problem is people get way too into these. And then it's like, I, you see it and you're like, yeah, and I love video games. And I love being addicted to video games. And it's just, I know if I play it, I'm, that's just going to become a large portion of my life. And I'm like, I don't want that. I don't want that. It's like a friend of mine. It's always like, dude. I mean, I don't recommend TV to him anymore, but I was like, dude, you got to show out this TV show. It's so good. And he's like, yeah, I know it is. Uh, that's why I don't watch it, because I don't want to spend my time watching that. And I'm like, oh my god. There's no one who wants this thing over more than I do. You know, I'd like my life back. You're so much more dedicated than I am to anything other than watching television. <laughs> Additionally, as the name suggests, Star Wars The Old Republic may have been set in the same universe as the movie franchise, but it was also set about three and a half thousand years before the events of the films. <laughs> that doesn't really count then, does it? It's like, that's, it'd be like, yeah, yeah, set in the present day. And by present day, we just mean like modern era. And I, actually, that's not even three and a half thousand years ago isn't the modern era i mean obviously in the age of the universe it is so that counts let's go with that the flow of time itself is convoluted with heroes centuries old phasing in and out what the hell is even that so fans we're never going to get a glimpse of the remotely familiar faces such as luke skywalker han solo or lumpy the wookie but they probably couldn't afford them that's probably why they didn't because it'll be like you know how much hands who's han solo played by harrison ford you know what harrison ford is if, if one thing above all else expensive I know. players are instead invited to sign up with one of two main factions the galactic republic or the sith empire and engage in an epic story driven mission featuring fully voice acted cutscenes in which you can collaborate with other online players to unlock new segments of the sprawling saga or you can just try and smash their faces in during combat i hate cutscenes any video games where it's like there's too many cutscenes is like bro bro Bro, bro, if I wanted to watch a movie, guess what I would have done? Were you about to press the skip button? <laughs> well, go ahead. Don't let me stop you. Stop it. Stop it. Skip, yeah. skip, 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 skip. It's essentially a Star Wars version of World of Warcraft on an enormous scale, but with more emphasis on compelling unfolding narrative. I can literally think of nothing I would hate less, unless they had some sort of football slash soccer mini game in there where you played as part of. Oh my god. Oh my god. Like things I don't care about. Star Wars, World of Warcraft, fantasy, narrative. <laughs> Evidently. And it took some pulling together. The initial story ran for 1,600 hours, almost as long as the Lord of the Rings Extended Editions. It feels like it when you watch it, doesn't it, Danny? Uh, it evolved over 800 people working on four different continents, along with close to 1,000 voice actors recording dialogue for 4,000 different characters in three different languages. Greg Zestruck, co-founder of the development team BioWare, reckoned that coordinating it was like teaching elephants to do ballet. Considering the vast scope of the project, some have even suggested that $200 million is perhaps a conservative estimate for the total cost, and that's the problem with game budgets, unlike the more transparent finances of Hollywood. I feel like that's the only time that sentence has been issued, ever. I made a whole video on my Today I Found Out channel about Hollywood accounting, and it was like, wait, 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 so they just kind of sc allegedly scam the whole thing to make it look like every movie's making a loss so they don't have to pay their actors and sh I'm like, I mean, 
allegedly but watch that video it's mad sketchy i don't think anything about it is transparent so what's the video game industry up to here here's my money take it take it and go away my hands aren't that dirty uh development expenses in the gaming industry are largely a closely guarded secret subject to speculation however there seems to be little doubt that the old republic was one of the most expensive video games ever produced at the time but had electronics art spent so long developing the damn thing that they ended up missing the mmo rpg boat the results could have been similar to some poor guy who started work on an exciting new pong variant in 1974 but developed it largely at a leisurely pace and didn't release it until 1990 you've missed the pong boat the old republic wasn't exactly cheap to play this used the subscription model meant that after players forked out 60 dollars for a copy of the game wasn't this like in 2011 six games weren't 60 bucks back into or like how much is that like 50 quid 40 something quid Actually, maybe go. I feel like games were about 30 quid back then. Is that about right? I don't know. But, um, like, that's today's game. Isn't it? I don't know. I don't know. I just buy everything on Steam. They then had to shell out an additional $15 every single month if they wanted to continue playing. F you, Star Wars Old Republic. That's a f ripoff. In order to break in, and you can uh, join my exclusive. <laughs> I don't have anything. <laughs> but look, some of my sponsors, right? It's like it's like 15 i won't mention them because i'm not sure who's actually sponsoring this video and they don't like it when i mention them in other, you know other videos like you know the, the other sponsors whatever look there's one sponsor that i say 15 dollars a year and it's crazy value in order to break even ea would need to attract around a million customers wanting to keep subscribing for the best part of a year they managed to grab a million customers within the first three days of the title getting released to huge acclaim and although there was a little wobble during the first year when subscription numbers dropped the game quickly game quickly found its feet after introducing a hybrid free-to-play option which is naturally designed to frustrate you with pointless long-winded barriers until you decide to give up and subscribe it sounds like another raid shadow legends no god please no and thanks to a steady release schedule of new expansion packs over the last decade the old republic is still going strong today really 10 years later i always risk like grand theft auto survive like five that game is still legit so i guess games can survive but have i not heard of star wars old republic probably because i've never gone looking for it and don't care it's now raked in over a billion dollars in lifetime revenue well shit. but how much does a star wars movie make more i bet just rely on that so it wasn't a bad little investment after all but is this game as good as percy the potty pigeon the jury is still out on that one call of duty modern warfare 2 Mwah. oh my god did i love this game as a student i'd go around to my mate's house and he had this tiny ass tv this was but this wasn't even that long ago it was what i don't know maybe 10 15 years ago we when was this out because i feel like it was quite recent 2009 yeah so like 13 years ago we were playing this on his stupid tv that he must have taken from his parents when they got a proper tv uh and we'd play the was it zombie survival or like wave survival and we'd just play it for hours and hours and hours and drink beer and eat food and it was great and i was like supposed to should we study absolutely not we have to get to wave 15. let's go we knew we knew what was important in life if someone had told us back then yo 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 boys maybe if you broadcast this on the internet you could even make money doing it we'd be like why are we at university exactly there used to be a retro arcade hall situated on the east coast of england which contained a section of old there used to be a retro arcade hall situated on the east coast of england which contained a selection of old battered but still very playable arcade machines and cabinets from the days of yore they even had a vintage what the butler score mutoscope from the turn of the 20th century but i have no idea what the f mutoscope is or what the butler saw or i don't okay one of my favorite machines was a pretty dark and brutal shooter called boot hill from 1977 in which two matchstick men cowboys limped slowly up and down on either side of the screen while trying to shoot each other over cacti and the very occasional moving wagon i was convinced for a while that combat games couldn't get more immersive or intense than this but fans of the call of duty series will probably argue the toss over that one and there can't be too many serious gamers who haven't played call of duty modern warfare 2. even i've had a go on it although this was largely by accident when my mate marvin unexpectedly brought his playstation 3 and a bottle of cherry rum round to my house <laughs> let the games begin <laughs> 
I can't say I ever properly figured out what was meant to be doing, but the Cherry Run was excellent. Released in 2009 by Activision for the PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and Windows, Modern Warfare 2 was the eagerly awaited sixth entry in the franchise. And this time, Activision had really ramped up the action. The first person shooter came packaged with three different modes, including single player campaign over 18 levels, but perhaps most notably, it had a more expansive multiplayer mode than any of its predecessors, in which players could compete against each other in death matches set across various locations on the game map. Yeah, we didn't have that. We couldn't play online. So we just play split screen. <laughs> I forgot to mention that. It was on this tie. The TV was literally like this big. And we were playing, and it was square, of course. And we were playing split screen Modern Warfare 2. <laughs> What, what are we doing? And we had to get so close to the TV. Modern Warfare 2 received universal praise upon its release and sold 4.7 million copies in the first 24 hours. God damn. And that was quite good news for Activision because they'd spent an absolute bomb on it. Here's the thing about most surprising though. Although Modern Warfare 2 is quite reliably reported to have a budget of around $200 million, only a quarter of that went into the actual development of the game. So where did the rest of it go? Uh, almost certainly marketing, right? Isn't that that's the biggest expense when they do this kind of? Shit. Well, bits of it went into the manufacturing and distribution, but the majority of it was pumped into marketing. Mm, mm, psh, big brain. Activision really went to town on the hype, spending most of the budget on prime time commercials, poster campaigns, and global launch events. While it's perhaps not so incredibly unusual when a marketing budget eclipses the cost of product development, it does feel a little odd to me that one of the most celebrated games in modern history only had a quarter of the jaw-dropping budget spent on making the actual game. Almost as if the quality of the game was a bit of a bothersome after thought yeah but also they have to spend a ton of marketing because there's loads of other companies spending money on marketing and they never make their money back although there are some like when a niche game really takes off like that word i mentioned earlier it's just this word game that you play on you play online it's even like it's a sub page on some random dude's website there's no marketing but it's swept everywhere but i think that's more chance rather than reliable marketing dollars being spent on marketing which is you know a much more guaranteed win you can't spend $50 million on a game and be like, hope this goes viral. <laughs> Maybe you could spend less and then, or make tons of games and then hope one or two of them go viral. But it's not, you can't do that for a big budget game. I don't remember asking you a goddamn thing. Fascinating fact, boy. Thank you for your brilliant insight into business. Let's move on. The game wasn't without controversy. The fourth level, No Russian, sparked moral outrage as the player attempts to gain the trust of a Russian terrorist group by participating in a mass shooting in a Moscow airport and opening fire on innocent screaming civilians. Oh my god, I totally forgot about that. I don't even remember that now. Did I play the single player? I feel like I definitely did. That's intense, though. Criticized as appalling and sickening, this level didn't make it onto some international versions of the game, including, not surprisingly, the Russian version. And even the Western releases were self-censored to some degree, as the developers decided to remove some of the scenes involving families hugging their children in terror as a massacre unfolds around them, on the grounds they might be a bit too upsetting. Holy f it's upsetting to think about! Why would you put this into a game, Activision? You f idiots! Allegedly. Plus, you killed a child. Amazing. Mission complete. That right there is why you're the best, boss. The one and only. It's worth noting that the game never actively encourages you to open fire on the civilians, and the terrorist group don't seem to mind if you decide not to bother. I mean, I get it. It's also like Grand Theft Auto, who hasn't just been like, let's kill some civilians. But it's different when the game is like, part of this mission is to kill civilians. I don't think there are any Grand Theft Auto things where it's like, yeah, go commit a mass murder. I don't, I mean, unless you're killing like bikers in some gang or some drug rivals or whatever. They're not just like, yeah, 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 head down to the mall and kill as many civ Wait, do they actually do that in Grand Theft Auto? I feel like there might be like original missions where it was like you got to sniper as many people as possible. Which in retrospect, that's pretty morally outrageous. I'm not, I don't want to be like some person who's all like, we should ban video games, they're corrupting our youth. But I mean, maybe we shouldn't encourage mass shootings? Maybe? <laughs> You're also given a warning message right at the beginning of the game that some players might find one of the upcoming missions to be disturbing and offensive, and you're given, to, given the option to skip that mission with no penalty. Controversies of real-life nature whipped up a couple of years later when Anders Bering Breivik, the Nazi perpetrator of the horrific 2011 Norway attacks during which he murdered 77 people, claimed in his manifesto he'd been using Modern Warfare 2 as a training simulation. Yeah, look, and the guys on 9-11 use Microsoft Flight Simulator. 
better to, to practice their plane skills. But it doesn't mean that we should ban Microsoft Flight Simulator. And these words from a raving madman only went on to fuel more speculation from lazy journalists that video games might be entirely to blame for every act of terrorism or violent murder, seemingly forgetting that terrorism and violent murder weren't invented until about 1982. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a brilliant scene in Star Trek The Next Generation where it, which was cut out. It's a deleted scene you can watch on YouTube where one of the characters says to the captain, um, the captain's like saying, we don't want to, you know, uh, we don't want to allow terrorism. And the, the, the crewman's like, he's a robot, Data. And he says like to the captain, why wouldn't we allow terrorism? It's proven to be extremely effective throughout history. And then he lists all these examples when terrorism has totally worked. And they were like, we have to cut that out because it's not okay. <laughs> but it's true, allegedly. Don't be a terrorist, okay? I'm not encouraging terrorism. Don't get any ideas. Terrorism is obviously fucking horrible. None of this dented the sales or reputation of Modern Warfare 2, which had more than doubled its huge investment within just five days of release and has since sold over 22 million copies, generating over a billion dollars in revenue. So Activision clearly knew what they were doing when they set aside three quarters of the budget for marketing. Totally, of course they do. And my mate Marvin was happy to spend months and months playing it and wiping the floor with novices like myself. But he was laughing on the other side of his smug face as the cherry rum slowly dried up on that day in 2009 and suggested we have a quick go at Boot Hill. <laughs> Danny and Marvin headed down to the arcade, sloshed after a bottle. It's like, where shall we go, master? Let's go to the arcade. Yes. And they're like pushing children off machines and like causing a ruckus. They have to have the police called. It's obviously speculation. That probably didn't happen. Now, just before we continue with today's video, gotta throw in a quick word for today's fantastic and time appropriate, as you will see, sponsor. Underlucky Stars. What is Underlucky Stars? Well, let me show you what Underlucky Stars is. And I'll just back up a little bit because it's uh, it's big. It's big. Check this out. Check this out. Can this fit in the frame? And also not reflect. <laughs> oh, God. Everything's so reflective. Uh, this is what it basically does is I'm sure there's some points they want me to tell you. But uh, it's basically this here is the stars above a time and location and date of your choosing. So you can choose any time from throughout history. I personally chose the date that my wife and I got married as this is a gift for her for Valentine's Day. You see how it's time appropriate. This is the stars above where we got married at the time that we got married, which is amazing. And this whole thing is, it's printed on, they have some specs here, 200 GSM grams per something uh 300 dpi i don't really know what that means but you look at it closely and it is just extremely beautiful it looks like uh you know i don't know like you find in an art gallery or something it looks amazing framing is also super nice it's just it's just i think it's a brilliant gift for valentine's day isn't it it's a personalized experience you choose from 15 different designs you choose your commemorative message you choose your size it's verified by nasa astrophysicists so you know it's real Amazing. They're deeply committed to keeping our skies clear and space lit limited by supporting the International Dark Sky Association. Okay, that's brilliant. I didn't even know that. I've not come across that talking point before. I mean, the main thing for me, I struggle with gifts sometimes. And just for this company to come along and be like, yo, fact boy, this is something you should definitely, you know, it's, it's a nice... It's a nice idea for a little bit of a romantic Valentine's Day gift, isn't it? Or just a gift for anyone to commemorate anything special. I think it's stellar. Get it? Um, that wasn't in the talking points. I literally made that up right now. I'm quite pleased with myself. You get 10% off by going to underluckystars.com forward slash brainblaze. Again, underluckystars.com forward slash brainblaze for 10% off. Go get this for your loved one. Why not? It's Valentine's Day, yes. And uh, now back to the video, okay? Oh, there's a link below in case you're lazy. Or you can't type. Marvel's Ara Avengers. It was like Marvel's Arenas. <laughs> I know this so little. I know nothing about this. Of course, it's not going to work out every time when Square Enix. I have no idea how to pronounce that. And I've seen that logo and that name so many times. Uh, launched Marvel's Avengers in 2020. You might have assumed that they'd been given a license to print money. Developed by Crystal Dynamics, a big budget action role playing brawler was released on a fistful of formats including PS4, Xbox One, Windows, and Stadia. Is Stadia still around or did they cancel that? I love that idea. 
The idea of not having to have a games console play everything on the cloud is brilliant. It is shit, Austin. I have a PS4. And, I mean, don't really use it anymore, but I used to, you'd, I'd travel and I'd take the controller with me and you plug it into your computer and you play your PS4 from your laptop wherever you are in the world. It was brilliant. And surely it's always worth spending a few hundred million quid on developing a product which is going to have the Avengers sprawled all over the packaging, whether it's a video game or a very expensive lunchbox. But Marvel's Avengers was destined to receive a strangely muted response. The game followed the teenager Kamala Khan as he gained superpowers shortly before the Avengers disbanded in disgrace after getting wrongly blamed for a terrorist attack. Captain America had possibly got a bit carried away after playing Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 for too long. Danny. Savage. In the absence of the Avengers, an ethically dubious science corporation called AIM... Wait, isn't there a real company called AIM? <laughs> Don't they make microchips? Isn't that a bit risky, company? <laughs> it's like, yeah, 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 an evil corporation called Facebook. Uh, sorry, Meta. Cringe. Uh, it's like, don't do that. You're just asking for legal trouble. Moves into the position to take their place, and it's Kamala's job to reunite the Avengers and get the band together to take on their new enemy. It's a weird kind of hybrid single-player campaign, which can be pay played offline, and a multiplayer live service which is regularly updated with a constant stream of fresh online content to keep players hooked for the long term. Okay, this all sounds quite compelling so far. Where's the problem? And whilst I've just said that the response was muted, it's worth noting that the game topped the global charts during the first month of release, probably because they spent three quarters of a huge budget on just marketing it. And I mean, you could sell anything. You could sell anything. I sold a perfume called Rotting Turtle. I still do. You can, and people still buy it. There's a turtle they make called Rotting per Turtle. A perfect, did I say a turtle that I made? There's a perfume I made called Rotting Turtle. Rotting Turtle, there's a link below. And uh, yeah, because marketing, it's also fun and it smells great. Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. A few moments later. Mm, 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 mm. I smell fantastic. I've just got a collection of merch on my desk now. I can also get this blaze cup. <laughs> Here! Here's my money! Take it! Take it and go away! My hands aren't that dirty. Most critics seem to agree that Marvel's Avengers isn't exactly a terrible game. It's just a very mediocre one wrapped up in VIP packaging. Oh my god, big brain again. Uh, this, God, that stuff does smell fantastic. It really does. The single-player campaign was generally fairly well received, and the game may have worked better if it had focused entirely on the angle, especially considering... And the game may have worked better if it focused entirely on that angle, especially considering that Crystal Dynamics had already had had or, already had vast experience in creating hits. A, bah. Especially considering that Crystal Dynamics already had vast experience in creating hit titles in this format, including Soul Reaver and later the Tomb Raider releases. Tomb Raider was tight. I remember playing that as a kid. That was great. Um, but Square Enix, Enix had insisted on developing an angle which took advantage of the lucrative live service trend. What the f*** is that? This is where critics observed that the game fell apart. There were various unfortunate bugs and glitches, including lengthy loading times and too much emphasis on the loot box system, which continually attempted to grab yet re more real money from players who had already shelled out a hefty sum for a copy of the new game. Didn't loot boxes get into a lot of trouble because they were like, wait, 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 wait. Isn't this gambling but for kids? I feel like they were like there were there were, there were the loot boxes, right? And you could select one, and it would you'd pay for it, and then it might have something awesome in it, or might have something sh or nothing at all. And it's like, bros, that's gambling, and you're selling it to kids. Didn't a lot of people get in trouble for that, or am I imagining that? Or is it one of those things like I don't know these NFT crypto coin bullshit where it's like YouTubers seem to make like some cryptocurrency, and then they pump and dump it, and I'm like, no one seems to care. It seems like that seems super unethical and maybe illegal. I mean, doesn't it? You're just stealing money. Basically. I mean, I know it's like, buy beware, but shit, guys, come on. This is massively unethical. Overall, it was felt that Marvel's Avengers was a repetitive and technically flawed game, which wouldn't have generated a flicker of interest from anyone if it hadn't been dressed up in an Avengers costume. This is like the games of the past, like the James Bond games, which I actually liked, but all of those uh, movie games that were shit. 
Although Square Enix never officially disclosed how much they spent developing the game, analysts were able to make a pretty good guess when the company disclosed how much they had lost. In November 2021, Square Enix president Yosuke Matsuda admitted that Marvel's Avengers had been a commercial disappointment, only shifting around 60% what the company had hoped and contributing to a total loss of $63 million for that fiscal period. Mm. This would appear to indicate that the company plowed somewhere between $170 to $190 million in developing a project with a surprisingly costly endgame. Ah, oh, I know that's a joke because there's the movie a butter bob bob. They should have gone with Brave Little Toaster Civil War. Yeah, but then no, then it would have just be a game wrapped up in packaging and no one would have bought it at all. They wouldn't even made 60 mil, which is a lot of money. But I mean, when you spent 200 or whatever, it's like, ah. I'm broke, I'm broke. Star Citizen. And finally, we arrive at the most expensive video game of all time, which only comes packaged with one tiny problem. It hasn't been released yet. And it's now at least eight years overdue. Cloud Im- <laughs> Holy <laughs> man. Cloud Imperium games are notoriously litigious when anyone dares to criticize the delay of Star Citizen. Mm -mm. I mean, it's probably because they're making it really good. That's why it's delayed. It's because it's becoming brilliant. It's made being made more brilliant. That's why it's delayed 100%. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, so we'll have to couch our language very carefully as we discuss what I'm sure will be a spiffing game when all those perfectly natural teething troubles are ironed out. Star Citizen has now managed to attract over $400 million in funding, which means that they have a huge budget for lawyers. <laughs> which means that its development for budget has surpassed even the most expensive movie in history pirates of the caribbean on stranger tides which had to make do with a paltry 379 million dollars in 2011. isn't that like pirates of the caribbean like 11. did anyone actually see that and i'm sure they did because i'm sure it's massively profitable but who the f is going to see pirates of the caribbean 11. who the actual f is doing that if you're doing that let me know in the comments and let me know what is up with your life I mean, because Pirates of the Caribbean, fine, great, not bad movie. Maybe the first two, but it's like, what are we doing with number 11? Isn't it just an excuse for Johnny Depp to buy loads more wine? Daddy, chill. In a way, Star Citizen is a spiritual successor to the original space trading video game Elite. First released for the BBC Micro and Acorn Electric in 1984, as a ways back, but the founder and director of Cloud Imperium, Chris Roberts, prefers to think of it as the spiritual success of the groundbreaking Win Commander franchise, which he developed himself in the 1990s. Star Citizen combines elements of space trading, flight simulation, first person shooter, and massively multiplayer online genres across several different modes or modules. With a focus on high-end PC hardware, the hugely ambitious game promises virtual reality support, flight stick support, and no subscriptions or play-to-win mechanics. That sounds pretty good to me. Part of the attraction here is that Star Citizen isn't your usual tat churned out by a gold money-grubbing corporate entity. The project was funded almost entirely by the gaming community itself. I have to say, it does sound kind of fun though, doesn't it? Uh, after pre-production kicked off in 2010, Star Citizen was first launched as a Kickstarter project in 2014, where it managed to raise $15 million within the first year. After that, it went on to raise close to $40 million, and it became officially recognized as the most funded crowdfunding project history it at the time. As of November, <laughs> projects since then have raised more than $40 million? Damn. As of 2021, Star Citizen has raised over $400 million dollars that is such an extraordinary amount of money including additional investment from private investors and further sales of exclusive content to loyal backers cloud imperium has promised that every cent will go into development of the game let's hope they don't follow so who's paying for all those litigious lawyers allegedly what what i don't know may i'm just i'm just uh, would no comment let's hope they don't follow activision's business model and put aside about around about 399 million pounds for marketing dollars says pounds dollars uh, all of this sounds jolly exciting, but bearing in mind that the game was originally intended to launch in 2014, a few impatient baggers have dared to stick their hands up and ask the question, well, where is it? So that was a fucking lie. Over the years, a couple of small modules have surfaced, which have allowed players to take their first baby steps into Star Citizen and to get a kind of preview of the forthcoming full game. But critics have argued that Cloud Imperium are largely using these to grab even more money from microtransactions, such as selling starships and plots of digital real estate, which don't actually yet exist. That's what critics would argue. Certainly something that I would never say. I would just bring you the opinion of a critic who is not me. Uh, and this does seem to go entirely 
squarely against the ethos of the game. Further controversy was sparked when Cloud Imperium decided to charge $20 for a digital pass to anyone wishing to watch Citizen Con, which is effectively just an big, another, another big marketing push for the game. It does seem odd that after raising over $400 million, the company was still trying to squeeze more money from those backers by charging them to watch the latest promotional fluff. Chris Roberts later reversed the decision on this and declared that he was going to chalk this one up to experience. Okay, fair enough. We can learn from our mistakes. Frustrated backers seeking a refund for their pledges haven't had much luck yet, possibly because in the terms and conditions, which were updated in 2016, said they were effectively locked in. And but they were declared that backers were making a pledge on the project, which may take some time to develop, and they were not specifically purchasing anything. Whoop de doo! What does it all mean, Basil? I don't know. Isn't it not that I'd ever encourage it? But isn't that what like? Uh, how long how long can you do a charge back for probably not years you can't go back and be like hey hey i made a charge on my amex in 2016 and they're like my dude you can't charge that that was that card expired that's you've had two other cards since then <laughs> not that i would ever encourage anyone to do that <laughs> don't do that one of the very few backers to get a refund was a guy who wrote a viral blog post on why he felt it was impossible for cloud imperium to complete the game as pitched uh, some have expressed concerns and allegations that Star Citizen is little more than that of vaporware, a project in which the enthusiastic developers are continually trying to generate ever more investment on a title, but they have no intention of releasing it in the immediate future, or even at all. Again, some have expressed concerns. I don't know about this. Definitely not a concern I have. I would never have that concern. I would imagine they are diligently working on this video game right now. In fact, I kind of probably think they are. And... I think this does sound like it'll be a pretty good game, if and when it's eventually done. You're a coward, you know that? Era Blaine Bla Brain Blaze, we wouldn't dream of alleging such a thing, but I feel supremely confident that Star Citizen will be released at some point in my lifetime, assuming Simon keeps his promise on the cryogenic chamber thing. <laughs> After all, it would be a great pretty if the most expensive video game of all time turned out to be a game that nobody will ever get to play, but there's certainly going to be a lot riding on Star Citizen when it eventually emerges from development. Far more than, say, Flappy Bird, whose lone developer rapidly became a millionaire after knocking up the game in less than a week over a few cups of coffee and a couple of packets of milk chocolate hobnobs. Now that's how you develop a profitable game. Yes, indeed. And this has been another episode of Brain Blaze. Thank you so much for watching. This was a new segment we're doing called Culture Corner, uh, where we cover video games and movies and stuff like that. Mostly things that I'm completely unaware about. But Danny informs me. And thank you for watching. But the video game industry is no longer just serving pale children and peculiar men who live in their sheds with their pet ferrets. Danny?